Thank you for joining us today on this excursion to explore Toronto's heritage. From the time we opened our very first branch in 1903 on the corner of Young and Wellington, RBC Royal Bank's journey has been one of partnering with other prominent city builders to help create this strong and diverse metropolis. RBC, our clients and our employees share a deep affection for this great city. We take pride in our long and continuing chapter in Toronto's story. From building new branches, to building careers, to building communities through our countless philanthropic activities that enrich our city. Like being the biggest corporate supporter of United Way, helping organizations welcome newcomers to Canada, as well as sponsoring these podcasts to share our strong shared history. Whether you're new in town or a local like me who is seeing the city through new eyes, I hope you enjoy taking in the sights and sounds of Toronto past and present. I invite you to let your imaginations run wild as we step back through time to discover our diverse history and hear the tales of this vibrant city. Finally, as you wander through our neighbourhoods, keep an eye out on every street corner for an RBC footprint. From the interesting architectural style spanning the decades showcased in our local branches, to the famous gold Royal Bank Plaza Towers on Bay Street, to community events like the Toronto Film Festival, Winter City and RBC Daisy Fest. RBC is truly privileged to be part of the local landscape and to help tell Toronto's stories today. We look forward to helping create many more tales and working together to build this great city. I hope you enjoy your tour. Islington had the advantage of being on the main east-west road through the center of the township and because of that the municipal offices for Etobicoke Township were located here. Dundas was built in the 1790s by Simcoe's men. Dundas was like 401. Uh, today. So travelers on Dundas would come. There were stagecoach companies. It was about nine and a half miles from Toronto to here, which would be several hours. People who kept diaries and journals at that time will remark about the traveling road conditions. We think of, of holiday time now as in the summertime, but in the 19th century, the time for visiting and travel was the winter because most people were farmers who were least busy then. So the travel was mainly in the winter time. So that would have been the busiest time for innkeepers such as Thomas Montgomery. Hello, and welcome to Heritage Toronto's audio walking tour of Islington Village. As with all of Heritage Toronto eye tours, this one is designed to be paused while you travel between stops. At the end of each stop, we'll give you clear instructions on how to get to the next point. That said, you should download and print the map of the tour for easy reference. To make sure you don't get lost, we'll include visuals of maps for any areas that we think might be confusing. In only a few blocks, there are an array of high-rise buildings documenting the history of urban planning and residential high-rise architecture from the mid-20th century to the present. Here, close to Islington subway station, those towers are all around you now. As directed on our website, you should be standing on the corner of Aberfoyle Crescent, an east-west street located just north of the Islington subway station and Islington Avenue. We are now going to send you into the valley of Mimico Creek to begin our story. Proceed east on Aberfoyle Crescent, away from Islington Avenue, and walk until you come to a set of tennis courts on the north side of the street. You can press pause now and start up again when you're ready to start the walking tour. Stop number one. Directions into Tom Riley Park. Welcome back. You should be standing beside the tennis courts on the north side of Aberfoyle Crescent. We are now going to take you down into the valley of Mimico Creek for a quiet walk. You'll be walking through what was once known as Central Park until it was renamed in the late 1990s after Tom Riley, Etobicoke's Commissioner of Parks and Recreation for 36 years. But its history stretches much deeper into time than that. There's no better place, perhaps, to talk about this area's rich Aboriginal history. To get to the creek, Find the path leading into the park area between the tennis courts and the end of the subway tunnel, which you are now standing on. Follow this path and make your way down to the bottom of this small hill. Once there, follow the path to your left, heading north through the park. Follow the same path under a railway bridge and past a baseball diamond. Keep the baseball diamond on your left as you walk north. Once you have passed the baseball diamond, resume play. We'll pick up our story there. 
Press pause now and resume play once you have passed the baseball diamond. Stop number two. Mimico Creek and Aboriginal History. You should now be standing at the north end of the baseball diamond with a parking lot to the north and a bridge over Mimico Creek to your right or east. Find a comfortable place to stand on the bridge or beside the creek. This small creek has been described by the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority as a completely urbanized waterway. For that reason, perhaps, it is easily overlooked today. Mimico Creek, however, is one of this area's most ancient and defining historical features. Its source lies in Brampton and on the edge of the Oak Ridges Moraine. The water burbling past us will carry on to run under Lakeshore Boulevard and enter the lake at Humber Bay Park by Park Lawn Road, just west of the mouth of its much larger neighbor, the Humber River. Water has run along its over 30-kilometer route, cutting this valley into the land since the retreat of the last ice sheets some 12,000 years ago. Today, only 2% of the land drained by Mimico Creek still has its natural cover. Some 60% of the creek's route has been channelized. Yet in spite of the two centuries of massive alteration of its watershed, this creek continues to connect us through time to the first people who stood by its banks. Those people likely arrived in this area, then dominated by tundra and open boreal forest, around 11,000 years ago. Small groups of people hunted mastodon, moose, elk, and caribou, leaving no trace of their presence beyond their stone tools. Several very small 10,000 to 11,000-year-old archaeological sites have been found along ancient shorelines of Lake Ontario's larger predecessor, Lake Iroquois, to the east and west of Toronto. The local climate and vegetation had changed by approximately 7,000 years ago to resemble today's conditions. Aboriginal peoples adapted gradually to the change, eventually settling into familiar territories where they gathered nuts and hunted deer at small inland camps during the fall and winter, and joined other bands in the spring and summer at river mouths to fish and trade. Around 1,100 years ago, crops of corn, beans, and squash began to be planted and harvested. Agriculture resulted in a shift to a more permanent village life, one associated with the Huron-Wendat and Five Nations people who occupied this area when Europeans first arrived in the 1600s. By about 1700, ancestors of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation called this area home. In a land deal begun in 1787, the British purchased this area from the Mississaugas, who eventually relocated to the Hagersville area along the Grand River in the 1840s. The purchase of this land from the Mississaugas was finally resolved in 2010. While rich archaeological sites of the First Nation villages have been found on other Toronto rivers and creeks, nothing similar in size or importance has been found along Mimico Creek. That said, the creek would have no doubt been a useful source of drinking water and perhaps small fish for Aboriginal peoples, and a possible village site might exist on Mimico Creek north of the Queensway, where a number of artifacts were found by a local resident and reported in 1971. Aboriginal artifacts have also been found in the cemetery of St. George's on the Hill Anglican Church, which we'll visit on this tour, and at Six Points, where Bluer, Dundas, and Kipling meet. And today, the City of Toronto considers any land within 250 meters of a waterway, including Mimico Creek, as having rich archaeological potential. It's worth noting that unlike larger rivers like the Humber, Mimico Creek did not have enough water flow to become a major site of water-powered mills. That said, Mimico Creek was an important factor for these farmers who had fields which lined the creek area. Livestock could drink from the creek, while vegetables and other crops could use the water for hydration. For the larger community, Mimico Creek became a play destination. The creek was a popular spot for kids to wade, fish, skip stones, and just plain old fool around. Come winter in the 1940s and 50s, the local volunteer fire department would divert water from the creek to flood the adjacent flatland and form the local skating rink. The photo now on your screen is from the 1940s. And let me tell you one quick story about the name Mimico, drawn from an Anishinaabe term meaning resting place or abundance of wild pigeons. The name initially referred to the mouth of the creek, which served as a significant migratory stop for passenger pigeons. The name of the creek was early on applied to an area that stretched from the lakeshore up Mimico Creek to Dundas Street. When the town at the mouth of Mimico Creek gave its new post office the name of Mimico in the 1850s, the little settlement here quickly gave its new post office the name Islington, after Islington in England. Now that we've taken a look at Mimico Creek and heard something of the ancient Aboriginal history of the area, let's keep walking up the creek to a very important early European site on the creek bank. 
cross over the creek on the bridge, then take an immediate left and follow the paved path north to the Lawn Bowling Club. Lawn bowling has a long history in Islington. On your screen is a photo of the Islington Ladies Lawn Bowling Group in 1923. At its peak, it had 300 members and still boasts 189 members today. As you walk, you may see the occasional fruit tree, believed to be descended from the 19th century estate orchard of the Montgomery family, who once owned this land. Keep walking until you get to the south side of Dundas Street West, next to a large stone building. Press pause now and walk north along the path. Stop number three, Dundas Street West and Montgomery's Inn. We are now standing at the north end of the park on the south side of Dundas Street West beside a large stone building. Feel free to wander around it as we discuss its colorful history now. Although this area had fertile farmland at Mimico Creek to provide fresh water, Dundas Street, even in its primitive condition, was the greatest pull for people to this area. Just a few years after the town of York, later renamed Toronto, was founded in 1793, the provincial government ordered Dundas Street to be cut through forest from York to the town of Dundas, just west of present-day Hamilton, and from Dundas on to present-day London. This road, referred to at the time as Dundas Highway, was to be a military lifeline, allowing movement of troops and supplies and communications over land in case threatening American forces took control of lake routes. Dundas Street was also intended to open up the land along which it ran. It became a vein along which new farms and villages could be nurtured. Islington was one of those villages, as was Lambton Mills to the east and Somerville and Cooksville to the west. All of them, it's worth noting, were built at a crossroads of sorts where Dundas Street met a river, or where it crossed another significant road. Typically, these small communities became supply depots for the surrounding farm families, here, in Islington, people came from the surrounding area to retrieve and deliver mail and to purchase food, clothing, or tools. When they were here, they visited, gathered news, and enjoyed the social life of the small community. An important place for that visiting and socializing stands before you, Montgomery's Inn. This fieldstone building was constructed by Thomas Montgomery around 1830 and operated as a public inn for over 20 years. The inn was constructed in the late Georgian, or Loyalist, architectural style, as it is called in Canada, which is illustrated in the building's large center hall plan, its strong symmetrical balance and the fan-shaped window over the front door. Also typical of this style of architecture is the simple two-story box shape and multi-paned windows, both of which you can see before you hear. The inn was originally covered with a white pebble dash finish, a very different look from the stone walls we see today. You can see that finish in a number of historic photos of the inn on your screen now. During renovations in 1967, the borough of Etobicoke removed the pebble dash finish to reveal the stone walls, then considered more attractive. For Islington Village, as well as for neighboring towns, this inn was an important meeting spot. Not just a tavern or a place for social gatherings. Montgomery's Inn also acted as a meeting place for the local township government and for the Grand Orange Lodge, which met here in the 1830s and 1840s. Perhaps even more important was this inn's function as a stop for those traveling along Dundas Street. Transportation was so arduous and slow in the days of early settlement that taverns and inns were a necessary presence at regular intervals along main roads. Montgomery's Inn, much like local taverns or coffee shops today, offered comfort to travelers. When travel by wagon or coach over rutted or muddy roads was a bone-jarring affair, this was a place to rest those weary bones. Aside from being a soothing rest stop for travelers, this inn also offered something that some may have considered even better than the comforts of home. Alcohol. Montgomery kept a detailed ledger of his guests' drinks, which included beer, wine, whiskey, brandy, gin, cider, hot toddies, eggnog, and peppermint drink, which consisted of whiskey, sugar, and peppermint oil. What's a popular local tavern without an extensive bar menu? Though today the role of this inn as a City of Toronto museum is taken for granted, the story of how the inn became a museum is about as interesting as its early history. In the 1960s, there was pressure to move Montgomery's Inn to Black Creek Pioneer Village. The purpose of moving the site was to open up the land for development, to continue the speedy urbanization of this area. Thankfully, the Etobicoke Historical Society began a long but successful struggle to have the building preserved as an historic site on its original location. 
Today, Montgomery's Inn stands before you as a strong reminder of the village's past. Let's continue now by walking east on Dundas Street, away from Montgomery's Inn. We are walking towards 4681 Dundas Street West, the former site of the home known as Briarly. Walk past the set of lights ahead at Chestnut Hills Crescent, past Donnybrook Lane, and come to a stop on the corner of Briarly Lane and Dundas Street. Press pause now. Stop number four, Briarly Lane. Welcome back. You should now be standing in front of Briarly Lane, a private road with a small brick gateway and numerous townhouses lining the street. This is the site of Briarly, the home of William Montgomery, Thomas Montgomery's son. Briarly was originally built in the 1830s as a single-story Regency-style cottage and was sold in 1850 to John Bull Bagshaw, who likely added the home's second story and Italianate decorative features. Circa 1870, it became the home of William and Jesse Montgomery, who raised ten children here. Originally, there was a large veranda on the outside of the house, which the Montgomery family would use on warm days. Look at your screen now to see an image of Briarly. Today, there is no sign of the original Briarly, other than the street name Briarly Lane. In 1989, to much local protest, Briarly was torn down. Here's Randall Reed, who was working at Montgomery's Inn at the time. What Mr. Reed and others found in Briarly, before its destruction, has informed the interpretation of Montgomery's Inn today. My colleague and I uh, watched the demolition process, and we discovered the original wallpaper was still visible underneath the, the re-studded walls that were put in the 1870s. It was the Rococo design, scroll design in, in burgundy and... Um, and gray, and that wallpaper inspired what we selected for the sitting room here at Montgomery's Inn, only ours is in blue. The restoration wallpaper that we have here, is, it's a period design, but not um, period to this house, but it was adjacent, very similar to, adjacent, to the adjacent house, Briarly. As you can see, the land on which Briarly once stood now accommodates nearly 20 homes. It is an indication of what has happened to Islington Village, as this part of Etobicoke has been increasingly urbanized. As land has become more valuable, apartment buildings, as another example, have replaced single-family homes. At the same time, older buildings surrounded by significant amounts of land have been demolished to make way for new and larger buildings which occupy much more of that land. As we walk further east along Dundas Street to our next stop, note that trend along both sides of the road. Small, older homes taking up only a part of a large lot are slowly being replaced with larger homes occupying more of that lot. It makes for a streetscape that itself tells the history of the development of the area. As of 1939, much of this stretch of Dundas Street running east was still lined with farmland. A number of older homes date to the late 1940s and 50s. Others date from the 60s and 70s. Those are joined by what we might call second-generation homes the second to be built on a particular lot after the first was demolished. Let's start walking this stretch so you can see what we mean. Look down the street, away from Montgomery's Inn to the east. Do you see a white church steeple in the distance on Dundas Street? That's where we're headed next. Turn around now and retrace your steps back, or west, to the lights at Chestnut Hills Crescent and cross to the north side of Dundas. You will want to take this opportunity to cross the road here, as this is the only safe intersection with lights before reaching the church. Turn right and walk east along Dundas towards that church steeple. Once you're at the church, make your way up the driveway to the grounds and start listening to the tour again. Press pause now. Stop number five. St. George's on the Hill, Anglican Church. How was your walk? Like many before you, you piloted your way here by the church's recognizable steeple. For over 160 years, this church on the hill has been a landmark and navigating point. The obvious feature of this site, its elevation, was very likely appreciated long before the church in front of us was built. In 1971, the site was registered for its archaeological interest. Aboriginal artifacts were reported found in the cemetery indicating that Aboriginal peoples also appreciated the elevated view over the surrounding land from a village or camp on this site. It's another reminder of the ancient history of the people who have lived and loved and died on this land. 
You are standing in front of St. George's on the Hill Anglican Church. We should note up front that this site remains an active church and private property. The graveyard, in particular, is a site that is sacred to the memory of all those buried there. Please, be a respectful guest at all times. In 1844, this land was presented to the Church of England by a local miller and merchant named William Gamble, the man responsible, by the way, for the old mill, which long stood as ruins on the Humber River near Blue. The original stucco church was completed in 1847 and was dedicated by the legendary Right Reverend John Strong, Bishop of Toronto. Although that first building was much smaller than the church you see before you today, it was a source of great pride for those in the Islington community who, prior to the church, were meeting in a log schoolhouse. An 1862 painting of that church can be seen on your screen. As the community around the church grew, so did the building. In 1894, the church was raised and placed on a new stone foundation to provide a basement. At the same time, its stuccoed walls were covered with brick and a front porch was added. You can see that church in the photo now on your screen. In 1937, the church was lengthened. Then, to provide space for a growing population after World War II, the church was extended out on both sides to provide transepts, and then extended again in length to create a cruciform shape. Somewhat miraculously, inside the church in front of you today are still three of the walls of the much shorter original 1847 building. In spite of 160 years of adaptation and change, the spire, too, is the original. What you see is the same spire that so many years ago Bishop Strawn stood below with a small cluster of early Etobicoke families. With Dundas a rural highway and only forest and fields about the church, it must have been a place of beautiful quiet. Inside the church, old glass windows mingle with new, including one window in particular which depicts three eras of Islington Village's history. In the first, a missionary preaches to the First Nations peoples. In the second, a farmer works his fields with St. George's in the background. In the third, St. George's sits among other local churches, all offshoots of the church here. Today this site remains a thriving center within the greater Islington community. Not least of all because of the activity of the Kingsway College School, which joined the church on this site in 1990, and which built the new addition to the rear of the church building proper. Beyond this church lies its cemetery, also established in the 1840s and witnessed to thousands of burials. Here, around each grave site, have mourned the families and friends of the people who have occupied Islington's homes, built up its businesses, farmed its long-gone fields, and helped it grow into the urban and diverse community it is today. It's truly a sacred site, a place of memory, created for us as much as for those who lie buried here. Wander in if you have the time and read the names of some of the families who founded Islington Village. Pause now, then press play when you are ready to continue the tour. To get to our next stop, leave St. George's on the hill and walk back west to Montgomery Road, which is just before you get to Montgomery's Inn. To get there, follow your footsteps back to Chestnut Hills Crescent and cross to the south side of Dundas Street there. Stop at the corner of Montgomery Road for your next set of directions. Press pause now and resume play at the corner of Montgomery Road in Dundas. Stop number six, Montgomery Road. You are now in the corner of Montgomery Road in Dundas Street West. While we are here, let's enjoy some of the great views of Dundas Street, looking west over the past century. You can see them roll by on your screen. To make sense of those images, note that until 1962, there was no bridge on Islington Avenue over Mimico Creek. As a result, Islington Avenue coming from the north ended at Dundas Street to be continued again at Bloor Street. Through the Creek Valley south of Dundas, the Islington Avenue right-of-way was merely a dirt trail. There was, however, a bridge on Dundas Street over Mimico Creek since at least 1812. These photos show first a wooden bridge carrying Dundas Street over the creek, looking west. This bridge was replaced in 1922 by a concrete bridge which has since been replaced again by the modern bridge in front of you. Now look south, down Montgomery Road away from Dundas. Montgomery's Inn was not a regular stagecoach stop, but rather was used by travelers and by farmers coming with their grain from Etobicoke farms and townships further to the north and to the west of the grist mills on the Humber River north of Bloor. Burnenthorpe Road was once called the Etobicoke Mono 6th Line Plank Road, a toll road that received its charter in 1846 
and funneled these farmers onto Dundas Street, just west of Mimico Creek. An astute businessman, Thomas Montgomery opened Montgomery Road on his private property, providing these farmers with a shortcut to the Humber Mills while increasing business at his inn. Until the 1940s, it's worth noting, Montgomery Road still traveled mostly through open fields as it made its way from here to Bloor Street. Already, however, it was home to one of Etobicoke's landmark institutions, Etobicoke Collegiate Institute. We'll head there now. Walk south down the west side of Montgomery Road. Stop in front of Etobicoke Collegiate Institute. It's big, you can't miss it, in front of its old main entrance. Pause now and resume play once you're in front of ECI. Stop number seven, Etobicoke Collegiate Institute. You should now be standing in front of Etobicoke Collegiate Institute, or ECI, originally known as Etobicoke High School. Schools can be reflections of the development of the communities they serve, and ECI is no different. When it was built, where it was built, and when it expanded, those things can tell us much about the growth of Islington Village and its continued emergence as a hub for education, transportation, and business in Etobicoke. It's notable first that ECI was founded in 1928, when Islington Village was still a relatively sleepy community, largely surrounded by farmers in their fields. Prior to that date, High school students in the area were either heading down to Mimico on the lakeshore or north to Weston to go to high school. It was first and foremost a rural school, meeting the needs of students from across central Etobicoke Township. The building, as well as the stories of its many students and alumni, is impressive. Built on the edge of the Mimico Creek Valley, the school quickly made use of the valley flats for sports fields and a running track, a purpose they still serve today. The original building was designed by architect Stephen Burwell Kuhn and Son. It can be seen with the playing fields on the Creek Flats in the wonderful photo of the 1936 rugby team on your screen. In 1928, ECI included the grand front entrance, complete with relief carvings above, flanked by classrooms on each side, with a gymnasium at the rear. The architectural firm, led by Stephen Burwell Kuhn and his son, Burwell Rancier Kuhn, has been called the most prolific designers of new school buildings in Ontario. Since Stephen, the father, was in his late 60s when ECI was completed, his son Burwell may have played a larger role in the school's design. The style of the building indicates this, as Burwell was known for paring down his father's more classical revival styles into simpler forms. ECI fits that description. The classical elements are there, the strong symmetry, the slightly projecting central portion of the facade containing the entrance, and the tall ionic plasters supporting the cornice and parapet of the roof line. But the pilasters and cornice are restrained, and the building is not heavily adorned, beyond patterned brickwork and the sculptural reliefs in the parapet. This could be called modern classicism, and it was Burwell Rancier Kuhn's specialty. In 1945, when he designed a major addition which widened the flanks, slightly set back from the original building, he used the original design. The reliefs, by the way, are a lovely touch and well suited to the building. In the left panel, girls and boys engage in scholastic activities, Music and reading, for example. In the central panel, they play. From left to right, children roll hoops. A boy chases a girl, and two boys chase a ball. At far right, children engage in work, hauling a bag of grain, perhaps, then seeding a field, then walking behind a cow, then harvesting fruits and vegetables in a basket on the shoulder, and grain with a sickle in her hand. Later additions to this high school took a very different stylistic direction than Burwell Rancier Coon's first, as you can see to both the right and the left. The periods of those additions again tell the story of the growth and development of the area. When the population of Etobicoke began to explode in the suburban expansion of the post-war baby boom era, so did the school. The 1945 edition was joined by another in the 1950s and yet another in the 60s. However, as demographics changed and enrollment declined in the 1980s, a large wing at the north end was removed and the building reconfigured. Before we move on, it's worthwhile to consider the generations of young people who have passed through ECI's doors, behind which were the keys to an education leading to jobs away from the surrounding farm fields. The school proudly holds among its alumni Montreal Canadiens legend Ken Dryden, musician Jeff Healy, Olympian and gold medalist Marnie McBean, and former Ontario Cabinet Minister and Speaker of the House, Chris Stockwell, to name just a few. 
We're now going to walk to downtown Islington Village, and we're going to take a cross-country shortcut back down into the Mimico Creek Valley and over the bridge we stood on at the beginning of this tour and up the other side. To get there, walk back up Montgomery Road through the north end of the ECI building. Turn left and take the paved access road beside the school down to the path that leads into the valley and over the bridge. Once over the bridge, continue walking straight ahead or west to Islington Avenue. Turn right on Islington and walk north to Dundas Street. Turn left on Dundas, crossing over Islington, and walk west until you are opposite 4884 Dundas Street West, which is on the north side of Dundas. We'll pick up the story there. Stop number eight. Southwest corner of Islington and Dundas. Mussen House and the Methodist Mans. Hello again. You should now be standing across the road from 4884 Dundas Street, a large two-story home with a green door and white painted brick. Before we get to the story of this house, look back the way you came. The story of the southwest corner of Dundas and Islington tells us much about the way Islington Village has changed. First, and most importantly, I'll remind you again that Islington Avenue was not connected over Mimico Creek to Dundas until around 1962. Prior to that, it dwindled off just south of Dundas, cut off by the creek. The creek valley, with its dark soil, was very fertile, and until the 1940s, on both sides of the creek were market gardens. The south side of Dundas, from here to the creek, was lined with a few homes, including the Robert Tier Senior Residence, built circa 1860, which you can see now on your screen. Tier was a market gardener who grew celery and other vegetables on 16 acres of valley land behind his house. A second photo shows the house with the Jubilee Hall to the right, where Tier sold his vegetables on the ground floor, letting the second floor be used as a social venue. And in the foreground are some young women having fun in 1917. By the mid-1950s, the rush of post-1945 development had led to the replacement of the Tier residence and market gardens with the Thorncrest Motors Ford dealership selling shiny big new automobiles to the commuting residents of Etobicoke's burgeoning suburbs. The car dealership remained there until it moved to the Queensway in the mid-1980s and was replaced by the Barclay Terrace condominiums. So has gone much of the story of Islington Village, as we'll learn as we walk down this main street. But here we have the opportunity to see a relatively rare remaining historic building. Well, two in fact, if you use your imagination. The first is the one across the street, at 4884 Dundas. Not convinced it's all that old? The photo on your screen, taken around 1920, might help. As an aside, the two kids in this photo of their home are Thelma and Dudley Newlove. Dudley served as an RCAF pilot in World War II and was shot down and killed off the coast of Ireland in 1942 at the age of 27. A plaque to his memory is in the interior wall of St. George's on the Hill Church. For a very long time, the house has been known as the Musson House, after the Musson family that once occupied it. The Mussons once owned a large amount of land in the Islington and Weston areas and had a small sawmill just up Mimico Creek, north of Dundas. This house was built around 1865. The house is worth noting, not just because of its ability to survive, but because it served as something of a community hub, much like your local coffee shop or bagel place today. Thomas Musson was a postmaster of Islington Village for 30 years until his death in 1899 and was succeeded by his wife, Elizabeth, until 1906. For at least some of this period, the post office operated out of the back parlor of this home. And well into the mid-20th century, a trip to retrieve the mail could turn into a visit with a neighbor, a chat with a friend, or a tale from the local busybody. After 1908, the house was occupied by William and Olive Newlove and their children, Thelma and Dudley. The Islington Telephone Exchange started in 1909 in one of the village's general stores with three subscribers, but in 1910, when there were 38 subscribers, it moved to the New Love's home. Olive ran the exchange in the same room where the post office had once been, and the tradition of neighborly chatter lived on in a slightly different form. The building you see today at 4884 Dundas has, of course, been altered significantly over time as new occupants have made it their own. A widened Dundas Street has swallowed up the front lawn, and the front veranda is long gone. The original red brick has been painted white, although this two-toned brickwork can still be seen on the rear of the building. All that said, the Musson House remains an important part of the Islington community, 
and it is listed on the City of Toronto's Inventory of Heritage Properties. Before we move on to our next destination, look at the double store at 4879 to 4881 Dundas on this side of the street. On the east side of this building is a large mural depicting the interior of the building around 1888. It's one of a series of murals that the Islington Village Business Improvement Association has funded. Here's Linda Peterson of the BIA. A typical example of um, one of our murals is the one behind me, which is of the Nance Committee. And um, a Nance is a, a minister's residence. This particular one was located within this building that you see behind me, and it was for the Wesleyan Methodist Church. The Nance Committee uh, advised the minister's wife on the decor and conducted periodic white gloved inspections of the premises to make sure it was kept acceptably clean. Now, this particular mural has uh, some things that we're really, really proud of. Uh, the furniture that you see in the mural would have been available in Toronto in the 1800s. The construction techniques that are displayed are typical of the period. Uh, everything is to, uh, to scale. Um, it's based on a real life story. It's authentic as far as we can make it. Although it may not look that old, note the building's old rubble stone foundation below the mural. This building was in fact once a house, the manse for the 1887 Islington Methodist Church, which once stood immediately to the west of the house. Have a look at the photo on your screen to see a few photos of the house as it once was. To its left was the grand home of John Dillon Evans, a fruit farmer and a member of Etobicoke's Township Council for 18 years. To its right was the church, which became Islington United Church in 1925, and which moved to a new building on the quieter Burnhamthorpe Road in 1949. This vacated church building was then used for township offices until it was demolished in 1964. The church appears prominently in many of the old photos of the village that you'll see on this tour. Take some time to enjoy the mural and to read the information panel that accompanies it. This mural is the first of many we'll see today, the product of a brilliant effort of local businesses to celebrate this area's past. The murals are breathtaking and rightly brought lots of attention to downtown Islington. Continue to look out for these murals as we make our way around the area. We won't have the chance to mention them all, but we will point out a few that are of specific significance to your tour today. We are now going to keep walking west on Dundas Street, towards the corner of Burnham Thorpe Road. Once you're at the intersection, make your way to the northwest corner beside a group of stores, a coffee time, Canada Post, etc. Once there, continue with the audio tour. Press pause now. Stop number nine, Islington House and Islington's main intersection, Dundas Street West and Burnham Thorpe Road. You should now be standing on the northwest corner of the busy intersection of Dundas Street West and Burnham Thorpe Road. You are now in the midst of 21st century Islington Village. This commercial streetscape is striking, we think, for its lack of obvious 19th century commercial buildings, common to so many other old Ontario villages. On first glance, this looks like a streetscape of much later origin, with many buildings dating from the 1950s to the present. It's remarkable to think that this street is, by Toronto standards, very old. Where are the old rural village era buildings? First, as the historic photos on your screen illustrate, the streetscape of the old rural village of Islington was never densely built up with commercial buildings. It was instead lined by homes, fairly well spaced out, and by other well spaced out buildings, including a few shops, a couple of churches, a bank, and taverns. In 1846, it was recorded that the community had one doctor, two taverns, a blacksmith, one butcher, a baker, two shoemakers, two wheelwrights and wagon makers, two carpenters, and one tailor. All of those people were serving not only the village's tiny population of 150 people, but also the surrounding farm families which used the village as their supply and service depot. As a whole, the stability of this fellow village was remarkable over the course of the 19th century. By 1873, the population had grown only by about 50 people to approximately 200. A couple of general stores stood back the way we came on this side of Dundas. The first was immediately west of Mimico Creek near Islington Avenue. You can see a great photo of it on your screen. It is believed that this store was built around 1830. By the 1850s, it was owned by Thomas Musson, who we've already heard about. By the time of this photo, the store was owned by William Dunn, who, as a postmaster, operated the village post office in his store until 1927. 
The second general store was just east of Burnhamthorpe Road, owned by Frederick Hopkins. It appears in the photo of the streetscape on your screen now. As with several businesses in the village, the store was located in a former residence on Dundas Street, renovated by Hopkins in 1909 to hold the store on the main floor, with living quarters above. The building in the foreground of the photo now on your screen was a hotel. Its story, too, says something about Islington Village. It was first built circa 1839 as a general store, remaining a store until John Brownridge purchased the building in 1870 and converted it into Brownridge's Hotel. The photos on your screen show the intriguing evolution of the building over time, as different owners, the fire, and different tastes of different heirs took hold. Note also the drive shed visible in some photos to the east of the hotel. This drive shed was converted into a gas station and garage with the advent of the automobile, then demolished when Burnthorpe Road was moved from the west side of the Islington House to the east side to align with Cordova Avenue. The hotel survived as a bit of a legendary local watering hole and gathering place, affectionately known as the Izzy House before it was finally torn down in 1986 and replaced by the present building on this corner. And so was gone much of the old Islington Village streetscape. It was adapted and changed by the same forces that brought Etobicoke Collegiate's many additions and by those that brought car dealerships and new condominiums. Undeveloped areas between buildings were filled in. Private homes on this busy commercial street no longer made sense and were either converted into stores or offices or were demolished and replaced by commercial buildings or apartments. In periods of prosperity and growth, old buildings became dispensable in the march forward towards a modern 20th century Islington. This stretch of Islington Village, as it looks today, tells the story not of a small rural community, but of a bustling suburban Islington, bursting at the seams from the late 1940s on. Before you leave this intersection, look north from Burnhamthorpe Road at the beautiful stone Islington United Church, with its modern Gothic architecture, which opened in 1949 to replace their 1887 church on Dundas, the site of which we saw earlier beside its old man's. Now, continue to make your way west on Dundas Street until you find the Fox and the Fiddle pub, just past the strip of retail stores on the north side of Dundas. Press pause now and resume play once you are in front of the pub, situated at 4946 Dundas Street West. Stop number 10. Municipal Office and Cemetery. You should now be standing in front of 4946 Dundas Street West a building with a prominent mural showing a delivery truck in front of the old Islington Hotel during Prohibition. Also, turn around and look at the mural on the east wall of the retail strip on the south side of Dundas across from your location. This is the mural of Briarley, the home of William and Jesse Montgomery, the site of which we saw earlier in the walk. The house has been painted as it looked just prior to demolition. Now let's talk about 4946 Dundas Street West. Like the old man's converted into a store down the street, this building doesn't look all that old. But it actually contains one of the oldest buildings in Islington, the village's first Methodist church, built around 1843. In 1887, this church's congregation moved into their new church further east on Dundas. The land and the church building were sold to Etobicoke Township, which used the building for council meetings, public forums and social gatherings, as well as the village's first public library. In its conversion to a township hall, the church was bricked, and shallow buttresses were added down the side for support. Note the photo on your screen. Here, too, the story of Etobicoke's growth plays out. In 1850, the entire population of Etobicoke Township, far beyond the boundaries of this village, was 2,904 people. Thirty years later, when the township took over the building, its population had only grown by about 70 people. All of that changed, however, by the mid-20th century. As the township grew in population and complexity, larger township offices were required, and what you see before you today is the result of an expansion in 1946, once again just after World War II, when the township was growing dramatically. A second story was added, and a large neoclassical addition was put onto the front. The photo on your screen now shows the Etobicoke Township Council and staff in front of the building in about 1931. In 1958, the township moved into a new civic center at Burnhamthorpe Road in the West Mall. In 1967, Etobicoke was transformed politically from a township to a borough, and then, in 1983, into a city. In 1958, this building at 4946 Dundas became the district police headquarters. 
a subsequent owner made further modifications to the building, adding a large addition to the rear and turning the main floor into the old village restaurant. The Fox and the Fiddle moved in in 2000. What remains of the original church building, some wooden beams, lathing, and plaster, remains hidden deep inside the current building. But inscribed above the front door, still visible today, it says Etobicoke Municipal Office. On the east side of the building, towards Burnthorpe Road, there is a door with police inscribed in the stone above it. And on both the east and west sides of the center section, you can still see the buttresses that were added during the church's conversion into a township hall so long ago. While we're here, just walk a bit west on Dundas Street until you're near the front gate of the cemetery next door. In this very 20th century landscape, the old non-denominational Islington burying ground surprises us back to the days when Dundas Street was a dirt road lined with a smattering of homes and only a few shops. The Ontario Genealogical Society dates the establishment of this cemetery to 1844. It was opened on land donated for this purpose by local landowner Amaza Wilcox. There are gravestones with dates prior to 1844, the oldest being Jane Morrow, who died in 1807, but these likely mark the remains of those moved to the grounds after the fact. Like the Cemetery of St. George's on the Hill, this burying ground is the final resting place of many of the key builders of the community. In the back left corner are two tall monuments of Thomas and William Montgomery and their families. The two rows of Austrian pines that still line the cemetery path were planted in 1910 by William's daughter, Margaret. The graves also tell the tale of the fragility of life prior to the development of modern medicine, when much higher rates of infant mortality took a heartbreaking toll. Records based on surviving and readable stones indicate that over 40 children under the age of five are buried here. A number, like baby William Port, son of local cobbler Robert Port, lived only a few days. On the other end of the spectrum was Andrew Morrow, who was born elsewhere in 1764 and lived 87 years to die in Etobicoke Township in 1851. Just east of the front gate, near the sidewalk, are two more recent interments. The Reverend Stuart B. East, minister of Islington United Church for 26 years, and a local politician and historian who died in 1995, and his wife Mary, who died in 2001. Take as much time as you'd like in this quiet spot. When you're ready, Keep walking west. As you walk, note the building across the road at 4975 Dundas Street West. It's a great example of 1950s modern architecture and is another nod to the important growth of that period. It was built as an office for Etopico Hydro. You'll also encounter a few more beautiful murals as you walk west. Look carefully for them on front and side walls as you pass. The last mural you'll see on this tour is at 4994 Dundas Street West just after the intersection of Maybell Avenue. After you've enjoyed it, please walk back to the corner of Maybell Avenue and Dundas Street. Cross Dundas Street to the south side, and then walk south on the west side of Maybell Avenue. Stop opposite the Maybell Place Apartments at 49 Maybell and the small parquet to hear about this important piece of Islington Village. Refer to the map on your screen to help guide you there. Stop 11. Maybell Avenue and Apartment Buildings. By now you've heard a number of stories ranging over this area's long history of human occupation from 11,000 years ago through the 20th century. Islington Village is a great place for a historical walking tour because of those stories, but it's equally worthy of a tour because it presents a microcosm of the changing patterns of urban development right up to the present. Over the last two centuries, a number of waves of population growth have transformed this place and left their mark. This is a great place to see all of them. So far, we've noted the changing nature of residential development in the homes along Dundas Street West as we walked from Briarley Lane to St. George's on the Hill. We've noted the way the main street has changed from a well-spaced out collection of homes, churches, stores, hotels, and the municipal offices to a completely built up late 20th century commercial street. Here we have a chance to talk about how some relatively empty fields between Dundas Street West and Bloor Street were transformed into an area dotted with tall apartment buildings. First, it's worth noting here that Islington also grew in waves that were closely related to the development of convenient transportation connections to other communities. Dundas Street always served that linking role, of course, but before the automobile, travel by rail trumped travel by road. The first railway ran through Islington in 1879. The Credit Valley Railway connected this area to downtown Toronto on the one end and to Galt, Ontario, and beyond on the other. 
A ride to downtown Toronto took approximately 25 minutes. A small train station was built on the north side of the tracks on the west side of Cordova Avenue. The station closed to passenger services in the 1960s and has since been demolished. It's also worth noting that from 1917 to 1931, the Toronto Suburban Railway operated an electrified rail line or streetcar through Islington to Guelph. This line paralleled Dundas Street through the village. These rail lines changed the way people lived, shopped, and conducted business by connecting them to bigger markets for goods and to a wider range of consumer products. On the screen is a photo of a farmer taking a wagon of milk cans to the train station for shipment to Toronto. Being a stop on those rail lines made Islington Village a more convenient place to live and gave it a leg up over more remote rural villages. That said, as we've noted, the most dramatic change came to Islington Village after the Second World War, which ended in 1945. In the post-war suburban rush that transformed rural North York, Scarborough, and Etobicoke from fields of crops into fields of houses, the streets north and south of Dundas were filled in. Then, in the 1950s and 1960s, a new symbol of urbanity arrived in Islington Village, the apartment building. Central Park Terrace on the west side of Islington Avenue, south of Dundas, at eight stories, was under construction in 1961. The two Y-shaped towers on either side of Islington, just north of the railway bridge, were completed by 1965. Then came the subway in 1968. Unprecedented access to downtown Toronto led to unprecedented development. Until the mid-1960s, the area where you now stand has remained a neglected piece of land. Only one residential street stretched into it, with perhaps 30 houses. In the next 10 years, the fields and houses were replaced with these apartment buildings. A number of the buildings you just walked past down Maybell were constructed by Toronto Community Housing in the late 1970s. The tallest of these buildings on Maybell, the three Montgomery Mills Towers further east, are over 30 stories high. These buildings and their surroundings say much about how planners once wished to develop the available land around the old metropolitan Toronto. As you walk down to the Montgomery Mills Towers in particular, you'll notice the green space around them. This type of development has been called a tower-in-a-park design concept. It's legendary and hotly debated in urban planning circles. Originally proposed by Le Corbusier, a French architect and urbanist who was highly influential in the mid-20th century, this kind of development was once all the rage in Toronto and many of its neighboring communities. Montgomery Mills is a powerful example of the type. Early ads for the three Montgomery Mills towers described them as the first foray by the Meridian Building Group, the developer, into a higher-priced, more exclusive apartment market. The buildings boasted million-dollar recreation facilities, full-time recreation staff, and large banquet and meeting facilities, which would be a cultural focal point for the area. This was, a 1974 article in the Toronto Star made clear, the sort of development that planners of the Toronto subway envisaged 20 years ago. High-density housing clustered around rapid transit line stations with lower density and single-family homes farther back. The tower-in-the-park approach is no longer in fashion, but the vacant space around the tower is now considered to be unfriendly and isolating to residents. Current approaches typically bring buildings close to the street, placing commercial shops on the ground floor on main streets and surrounding the bases of the towers with lower-rise residential buildings, including townhouses. Just west of Maybell Place, on the former sites of two Roman Catholic schools, you can see this kind of development just being completed. Two more important points are worth noting here. First, these apartment buildings brought a much greater density to Islington Village, bringing thousands of new residents into a relatively small block of land. They helped transform Islington Village from a low-density suburban area into a high-density hub, focused around a new subway stop. Second, these towers have provided affordable accommodation for many newcomers to the area. Over the course of the second half of the 20th century, as Toronto has diversified into a multicultural city, Islington Village has followed suit. This community has been transformed into one that, like Toronto, as a whole includes people from around the world and everything from single-family homes to apartments and condominiums high in the sky. And here we end our tour of Islington Village. There is much more that could be said, of course, but we hope we've passed on enough stories to help you better understand this area for what it is, the homeland of Aboriginal peoples for thousands of years, than a community swept up in the growth of the modern city of Toronto. 
To make your way back to the subway station, keep walking along Maybell, past the Montgomery Mills Towers. When you reach Cordova Avenue, turn right. Then follow the sidewalk as it goes directly south, with a parking lot on your right, until you see a concrete staircase on your left. Take these stairs down to Islington Avenue. Turn right and follow the sidewalk south to the Islington subway station. This tour was written by Nana Robinette and Gary Medema, with assistance from Nancy Luno of Heritage Toronto, Randall Reed of Montgomery's Inn, and Denise Harris of the Etobicoke Historical Society graciously commented on earlier drafts. Randall Reed, in particular, opened up the vast photo collection of Montgomery's Inn for our use on this tour. Ian Campbell assisted with information and images for Etobicoke Collegiate Institute. Thank you to RBC for providing the financial support to make this and Heritage Toronto's other iTours possible.